Carburetor ice is possible with most normally aspirated aircraft engines. Certain engines are particularly susceptible. The Comanche 250 stock 0540 Lycoming engine can get carb ice at cruise power settings when humidity is high and it is mixed with a compatible outside air temperature. Unlike airframe icing, carb icing can occur in warm outside air temps due to the Venturi effect of the carburetor which lowers the ambient temperature. I'm Virgil from Plain Places. Dean and I were flying from Gatlinburg, home to Pensacola at 8,000 feet in our 1959 Comanche 250 when we encountered carb ice a couple of times at 65% cruise power. Outside temp air temps were around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, but we were flying near through an occluded front running into and out of clouds, giving the requisite high humidity. For aircraft with constant speed propellers, carb ice manifests as a loss in manifold pressure. Left unnoticed long enough, the reduced engine power will also start to cool cylinder head temps. It's important to add carb heat at the first notice of potential icing. Our Comanche has an EDM 830 engine monitor with carb temp probe, EGT, and CHT measurements for all six cylinders, as well as other sensors. On this trip, we had one instance of slow onset icing that reduced power gradually over about 10 minutes by half an inch of manifold pressure. We also had an instance where carb ice dropped the manifold pressure by a similar half an inch in a few seconds. In both cases, applying carb heat cleared the ice and the manifold pressure returned to the set power. Here's what that looks like in the cockpit. Here's the fast onset case. We've got cruise power set at 20.7 inches, which is about 65% power. Just in a second or so, it drops to You can see because we have a constant speed propeller, the RPM never wavers a bit. This time I notice pretty quickly, add carburetor heat, drops the manifold pressure a little bit because the mixture richens, but the carb throat temp starts increasing rapidly. So you can see we're flying through a cloud layer right at 8,000 feet, so I leave it on for a little bit. Once I was above 50 degrees carb temp, I closed it, and we came back to 20.6, which is a little short, so I decided to go ahead and try it again, plus again, we're still coming in and out of these clouds, so I know that the humidity content is pretty high. I take the heat back off. Again, we're still at 20.6, but these sort of things also take a little bit to settle out. And if I'd had the power set right at 20.7, it can sometimes take a little bit to jump back up, which is what happens, in fact. Letting things settle out, it pops back up to 20.7, and we return to monitoring. Here's 
Here's a slower onset, which quite honestly also took me a bit longer to notice. Once again, we're at 65% power at 8,000. At first, it just goes down a little bit over a few minutes. So three minutes later, we've lost just two tenths of an inch. Five minutes later, we're down 0.4 inches. And I also start to notice that the cylinder head temp on, the cold, on my cold cylinder has started to drop from what it had been for the rest of the flight. So finally at 12 minutes is when I really notice it. I add the carb heat. Now with this little vernier knob, I quite honestly, I didn't get it pulled all the way and didn't realize that for about a minute. So I'm watching my carb temp gauge, which you can't really see, it's part of the EDM 830, and it really hadn't risen above 40, and I usually expect it to go to 50 to 60 degrees pretty quickly if the carb heat is on. After a bit of thinking about it, I realized, well, maybe I need to make sure I pulled it all the way, and that's what I do here in a minute. You can see once I get it pulled all the way, the manifold pressure drops a little bit more with that mixture getting richer. The, temp the carb throat temperature goes way up quickly. And then once I push it in, it doesn't take very long at all. And it goes back to 20.7 inches and we go back to monitoring.